can have a lot of excuses not to do something. And some of them might be legitimate and real. And yes, listen to that. But if fear is the only reason, then you're doing it (laughs) because fear should never drive the ship of your life. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of The Squeeze. I am Taylor Lautner. That's why I wasn't a beatboxer, but I am Taylor Lautner. (laughs) Oh, my God. Hi. I saw your head starting to move. I was like, you know, I was feeling it. Uh, I did not know where you were going. With oh, that. yeah. I'm just going to keep beatboxing for the rest of this interview. Okay, I'm done. Good thing the interview is already filmed. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why we do the intros after the interview. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Just kidding. How's your day going, babe? It's a good day. Yeah. 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 It's a good day. It's beautiful outside. A little cold. Kind of odd for Los Angeles area, but um, it's gorgeous. Life is good. Family and friends are good. Um, I'm going to go play some pickleball. Lovely. So that always puts me in a good mood. Um, And we just had a terrific conversation with somebody that we were thrilled to get on this podcast. Yeah. So. We did. It's a good freaking day. Heck yeah, it is. On this episode, we have Miss Sadie Robertson Huff on, and I was so excited for this one. Yeah. Um. I just love her and the human that she is. She's just so kind and so herself and so loving and encouraging and is filled with so much wisdom. I didn't want the interview to end, even though I had to pee really bad. a little bit of wisdom. Yeah. I know. We like look down at her. I feel like this happens a lot, to be honest, but it definitely happened with Sadie. (laughs) We look down at our computer and I was like, oh. We've been recording for almost two hours. <laughs> We've been in here for a long time. We, we talked a lot before, though. Yeah. Was there something that stood out to you from her? There was, I literally, we finished the episode and you're going to hear me. I was like, I can't wait to watch this back because yeah. there's so many, she has so many like nuggets of wisdom. Yeah. Um, And she's just like lived a lot of life. Um, I didn't realize yeah. she was so young when the show came out. I didn't realize how old she was. She when was 14 when the show came out, mm-hmm. Duck Dynasty. For those of you that uh, aren't aware, she was 15 turning 16 when she wrote her first book. Uh, she was 16 when she was runner up on Dancing with the Stars. Yeah. I mean, then she's just done everything in the world since. Yeah. Every, did I say that? Correct? What did I say? Everything in the world since. Um, everything under the sun she's done. Yeah. She's lived a lot of life. She's yeah. my age. You guys are the same age? Mm-hmm. Ah, 97. Okay. Oh, wow. Yeah, but I also felt like I could relate to her a lot as well. Just, you know, both like growing up, we can't like, you know, the, the, the fame, you know, kind of hit at the same ish times in our life talking, you know, we talked about going through high school, you know, both actually going to high school and dealing with that. We related on fear and how that can, um, hold us back in life um, or how you can use fear to push you further and bust down those walls and break those boundaries. Yeah. Not like live a life defined by fear. Yeah. I feel like that's like a very cliche thing. Don't let fear define you, but like fear defined her for a very long time. Yeah. Um, And it's so cool to see, like, obviously you're still fearful of some things, but yeah. it's not the driving force behind the no. you doing things or not doing things. Don't let fear be the boss. Yeah. You know, like use it. Like I, I found that we talked about this with Sadie, but for me personally, I found that like being scared of things is a good thing. It's good. And it like it turned into so many wonderful things in my life. Like the things that I was most scared of and telling myself, I can't do that. I don't want to do that. I didn't want to do it just because I was scared yeah. <laughs> and um, it, all those things turned into, you know, wonderful things for myself personally. Um, and just, yeah, felt like I could relate to so much of what she had to say. Really, really special conversation. Yeah. Something that stood out to me uh, was one of, we asked her one of our lemon 11 questions. How open are you um, with the people in your life when you're struggling? And, obviously like a lot of what she does is just sharing her life being vulnerable a lot of the time but i love what someone had told her she was listening to something someone told her this um 
But she was like, everyone can know like the 99% about you, but that 1% will eat you alive. Yeah. And it's so important to have that person that knows your 1%, even yeah. though that's like so scary. Yeah. Like finding a partner, having like for her, it's Christian, her husband and her mom, like having that one person, whether Somebody. it's a friend, family, yeah. therapist, whoever it is, like having that one person to share that 1% with. Cause it's true like that. Like if you're feel like you're, like she was like not living an honest life. Like, like that's the one percent that ate her alive for so long, and yeah. like what was a big factor in her anxiety and in her fear. Uh, and that really relates to a lot of us. Yeah, you have to make sure you're sharing that one percent. Uh, yeah, but I am just so excited to listen to this episode <laughs> back. It's going to be so great. I love her. She's such a special human, and we are honored to have her here with us um, absolutely I can't wait for you guys to listen you are gonna love it enjoy Sadie thank you so much for being here on the thank squeeze you. we're so excited to have you I'm excited I can't believe I'm here actually in the squeeze house in this the squeeze awesome. in the flesh I love Surreal. it we so, can't believe you're here in the flesh yeah. <laughs> this is awesome we are so thankful that we got to like do this oh we're done perfect have you here yes um, but so we start each episode with our Citrus Got Real jar. It has Great. a bunch of very deep, serious questions. Wow. Well, uh, just to prompt the mood. So scary. If mm-hmm. you want to pull one, I should have had you pull one before oh, I okay. got you all That's to me. Oh, you're good. <laughs> this is my new drum roll. My ASMR drum roll. <laughs> mic. That's great. All right. Let's see what. Citrus, I got. Oh, I got two. That's scary. Okay, I just. Oh no, I didn't. It's just <laughs> the paper. The paper is really long. He, every time I, someone pulls, he's like, "The paper is so long." I was yeah. like, "I didn't have time to cut the edges. I just cut straight oh, across." It's perfect. <laughs> it's perfect. <laughs> oh well, how do you hang toilet paper over or under? Mm. You know, this is such an interesting question for me to get because <laughs> I am so not a routine person that I don't have you a don't preference. Care. However, it gets on there, it gets on there. Okay. And then I was thinking. About about this the other day I was like you know there is a better way but I can't remember which way I thought was better but I remember thinking I'm gonna start doing this yep. but this oh story gosh. goes nowhere because I forgot <laughs> what way it was so for those listening if you have any advice on what is the way or do y'all have the way I'm very passionate about this okay I think did I do I this one you, I think you because this is something I'm very passionate about <laughs> it, it, when she puts it on the other way or like or cleaner or something, it just totally messes me up. Definitely, it has to be over. It has because when to. you're pulling it from under, it's just, <laughs> just much like, more yes. difficult to like yank it off. When it's okay. over, you just pull it and it's just, I just feel like it's so much simpler. I think I see. I think I see. I yeah. think I see that that was probably the way because the under situation is a problem. Yeah, if you pull it, it, I feel like it just like can. Yes, like, it's hard role. to to get it off and that can just like catch and just like unroll. The thing is when you have a little dog, cause we have a little dog who jumps uh, and we have an almost two year old. So we're constantly walking into the bathroom with the toilet paper just everywhere oh my gosh. and ripped to shreds. And it's a combination of both of them, honey, taking it all off, Cabo shredding it all up. <laughs> and so, you know, they work yes, together. They do. <laughs> they work hard together. I'm like, you're lucky it's not 2020. This would be a bad situation yeah. for both of you. Oh, oh my gosh. Oh, that's yes. so funny. Thankfully we have uh, more toilet paper now. So that's hilarious. The toilet paper was that was like the last time. Not that you didn't snap at me, but that you got sassy with me. What? (laughs) That I know he likes it over. So, but Taylor's also (laughs) the person that won't put the new roll on. He'll finish the roll, Mm. leaves a roll there empty. I'm waiting for you to finish. Go ahead, finish. (laughs) Take the toilet paper out, put it next to it. So then I'll put it on. But he took it off to blow his nose or something. And then put it back on. And then later that day, he's like, babe, we just talked about this. Like putting it over. I was like, bro, you are the one that took it off. And put. now I'm scared what you're going to say. I'm just going to say that I've gotten a lot better at that. You have. You have. You used to get me in trouble for it. And (laughs) I feel like in the last year, I I feel like I don't do that anymore. I feel like I like posted uh, 
like Instagram story or I told Jason Lowe that you did that. And they you definitely like, called me out. I think it was it. a friend of Jason Lowe. I was like, he d- he'll just put the toilet paper there because we yeah. were talking about marriage or something. Yeah. And then since then, I felt embarrassed. Sometimes so. you need a healthy call out, you yeah. know, accountability. It helps. I yeah. mean, and I'm the same way with my husband because he is a little bit more particular than me. And I'm like, OK, if you're going to have the opinion, then you got to then you got to do it. You know, <laughs> if you care about the role, I don't care about the role. You got to put the role on how you want the role. <laughs> you know? Oh, my gosh. Oh, man. Man, the love, serious stuff. Those those serious questions. This like, is a strong start. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, now that we got that out of the way. Yeah. You want to dive in first? Um. Yeah. Sure. I guess let's start with the show. We'll go all the cool. way back to the beginning. How old were you when the show started? Okay, so I was only 14 okay. whenever Duck Dynasty started. We filmed our like pilot episode whenever I was in eighth grade. Then it came out whenever I was in ninth grade. And we filmed our last episode about a month before I graduated high school. So it was my whole high school career that we had our show on TV, wow. which was quite a way to spend high school, especially in a yeah. small town. I feel like if you're from LA, it's a little bit more normal to yeah. be on TV. But when you're from the other LA, Louisiana, yeah. it's not normal to be on That's TV. Yeah. And um, it was definitely a little bit interesting. Um, it kind of took a while. I feel like for the first season, it was so big um, as far as everywhere in the world. It really everywhere, yeah. especially in, in the country. Um, but because we live so sheltered, we didn't. I, di- I didn't really understand how big it was because my parents were traveling. They were going. We right. were just young. We're doing high school. Yeah. And then um, I remember all of a sudden it was like, oh, people are like showing up to my basketball games. Like lots of people to yeah. just like take pictures and, and like this is so weird or like yeah. track meets. Like we had to make like a rule at my school that people couldn't like follow me around at my sporting events and take pictures. Like it was just weird stuff that like we had never seen in our community, but it was like, it happened a little bit after the, the shock of the show because Mm -hmm. it took a while to get into that small town. Cause when you're not traveling, you don't see it as much. Yeah. But when that started happening, I was like, Oh, this is weird. So it didn't affect me as much. Uh, I feel like my freshman year as it started to later as the show continued to go on. Yeah. Did you go to public school your, through all I was of just that? Ask that? So I went to private school, but um, it was. But you were in school. Yeah, but I was in school. It. I was in school up until uh, when I was a junior. I was on Dancing with the Stars. And then that's whenever wow. I started to be homeschooled. But I still wanted to play sports because up until then, I thought I would go to college to play sports. That's what I was really passionate about. And I wasn't ready to really give that up yet. Yeah. And so I was like, well, how am I going to do this? You know, because yeah. what if this doesn't work out? And then I still want to go to college and I would like to do this. Yeah. And so we worked out a thing with my school where I could do the school at home, but still yes. play sports for the school. So I still had wow. involvement in school, cool. but I did most of my work at home because when I was on Days with Stars, I was out in L.A. for three months and then yeah. traveled a lot. We did tours and all kinds of crazy stuff after that. So it was, uh, wow. I was in school, but not really. I can't believe you were that young on it. Yeah. I didn't so realize you were that. 16, 17 max on Dancing yeah, with the Stars? Yeah, I had just turned 17. I was wow. 16 when I did my interview with them. And I was so awkward. I don't even know how I got chosen because <laughs> I was like the worst interview ever. I was so shy back then and yeah. like so quiet. <laughs> and my mom came with me to the interview. And it was like every question they asked me, I just looked at her. It was like, what's your name? I'm like, Mom, like, what's her name? I don't know. Like, I was like so nervous. And I remember thinking, I remember after my mom was like, well, I'm going to be on the show. You made oh me talk the whole time. She's like, she's like, what Hilarious. happened? Like, you blew it. Not really. My mom's so sweet, but she was kind of like, you know, you might not get on and that's yeah. okay. You know, you were a little quiet. Um, but it was about two months later. That was in June. Um, and then in August, um, I assumed I wasn't going to be on. I already had seen them announcing people that were going to be on this season. And I was at a football game, Friday night football game, his first football game of the season for our school. And I remember right after my mom said, hey, uh, we just got a call. And Dancing with Stars does want you to be on the show. They said, you're a week behind everybody else. But they decided to add you to the to the cast. And she said, you'd have to fly out to L.A. tomorrow and um, you're going to have to start immediately. They're going to go do all your promo stuff. Then you have to go to New York for the Good Morning America announcement. You go back. And this was like, what? Like, Whoa. my life didn't look like that before, yeah. you know? And I originally said no that night. I was like, no, I'm not doing that. It was yeah. terrifying. It's so yeah. scary, you know? Yeah. And my mom was like, I remember my mom said, you know, 
if you have a legitimate excuse, then I'll listen. But if fear is your excuse, then fear is never a reason to not do something. And I remember um, I really couldn't come up with anything other than I was terrified. (laughs) Um, My little sister also challenged me. She was like 11 years old at the time. And she said, Sadie... She said, is the is this the fear talking or is this Sadie talking? And it's like 11 year old just oh said that to me. I was like, whoa. Like, wow. And it's just like two people in my life who are really significant kind of calling me out for how fear, this wasn't the first time that fear had led me to say no to something I probably should have said yes to. Yeah. And so the next day I said, okay, I'm going to do it. And so uh, my older sister flew out to LA with me. We did literally uh, Mark Ballas picked me up from the airport, who was my dance partner. We went straight wow. to the studio put me in the, you know, the bedazzled dress. We did our picture. And then this was so embarrassing. But then right after that, they're like, hey, we had to go film like your stuff for the commercial. And so they take me into the studio and it's like the stage and it's just so big. And everyone there is like filming you. And there's all the pro dancers and the producers. And they literally put you on stage and they turn on Shake It Off by Taylor Swift. And they said, just dance, like just do whatever comes to mind. (laughs) This sounds like your worst nightmare. Literally. Oh yeah, no, me too. (laughs) I, and I didn't dance. Like I wasn't a dancer. I'd never done dance. Like this was not my thing. And I was like, okay, like, (laughs) what? And I was like, "Uh, what should I do? They're like, just dance. Like just be true to you. It's like for the art commercial. Y'all, no joke. (laughs) I literally did the sprinkler. That's all I could think (laughs) of. The sprinkler. (laughs) And then I never forget, I did this move because I saw saw it in a One Direction video. <laughs> I was like, that's cool. And I saw that, like that was literally on the commercial for Dancing with the Stars. It was like, oh, I'm looking oh, this wow. up after. Oh, no. oh my yeah. gosh. There was like a gif for years. I saw it like it, me doing like this move. <laughs> I was like, oh wow. I, I, mean, I was so, I was so out of my element. And I remember thinking like, my partner's thinking, oh shoot, yeah. we're not making it This is anywhere. who I got stuck with. This is who I got stuck with. It was literally a miracle. I made it, as far as I did, I would have never, ever thought that. Like my dad told me before going on, just make it to like week three so you don't embarrass yourself, yeah. you know? Just don't I be was the just first like, I'm just going to try to make it there. Oh, wow. So it was a shock that I did well on the show. But um, yeah, that was high school for me. It was, it was definitely crazy and interesting. And the show, you know, blew up a lot bigger than we ever thought it would. And I think that was just by the grace of God and what he was doing with our family and really cool to look back on. Did you have like, this is just out of curiosity because Taylor, he, you did like a year and a half, two years of high school. And then I think I finished my second year. It just got like too much for him. And Mm -hmm. he had to leave also because Twilight came out when you were a sophomore. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, But even like his freshman year, he always like got picked on called Shark Boy. And like, was it, did you have like a positive experience with it or were like in high school or were people like nice to you or were they not like how was that it was really hard and it was really hard because um so I went to private school so I had been at that school since I was in Mm pre-k so these people are like my best friends I mean they knew everything about me and everything about them we grew up together and um it was I always had a good experience I loved school and then um I guess my family's show started, like I said, it wasn't like at first because no one really realized how big it was. Mm-hmm. And my parents didn't let me have like a public Instagram at first. So I just didn't really know. And then when I started getting cool opportunities and started like missing school a lot to film the show, um, it started being like, well, why does she get to do that? Yeah. You know? And then, um, so that was kind of hard. But then it was like really hard whenever I remember... This is so dumb, but it was like such a big deal at the time. But, you know, you have like your places at lunch where you sit, like at the lunch table. And I had like my best friends I always sat with. And I remember I came back to school and I had, we had been traveling, we had been filming and they had like, uh, replaced my like spot. (laughs) Like they like all moved in. And I remember I went to go sit and they just like looked at me like, no, like you don't have a scene literally here a anymore. scene from Mean Girls. I mean, it was, and I mean, I was like so upset. So yeah. then I didn't know what to do. And um, my cousin, who is a guy, is in my grade as well, and he's always been like one of my best friends. So I just went and sat with him. And then it was like, oh, she sits with the guys. Like she's trying to be whatever. Oh, I was no. literally sitting with my cousin. It was like everything I did was like so picked apart. Like, yeah. So judged. So that yeah. was like super lonely. And I remember when I came back from Dancing with the Stars. It was like my first time to see all my friends um, who weren't really my friends anymore, but they invited me to this birthday party. And I came and I remember this girl came up to me and she said, um, 
don't talk about it. Like dance with stars. Like no one wants to know. Oh. And and literally no one asked me. Like we they never said like how was it or what was it like? like it was just like nothing. Uh-huh. And so like that was like super, super hard. Basketball was my thing. I love basketball. I always played and um it got really hard with just people on my team and stuff like that. And then it got really hard because the schools we'd play would like single me out. And so um like you know how boys are like boys are rough on boys. Like when you go to boys games, you expect the yeah. just yeah. people to scream out things or whatever. Yeah. But it's not like that at girls games. Like girls games, you just play basketball. And uh, we had a couple of games where we would go and this, the, I mean, it would just be packed and everyone brought duck calls. And every time I would dribble, they blow the duck call. Every oh time I'd gosh. shoot, they would say quack. Like it was just like, <laughs> and they had signs and it was just like, like just mean. And it was just yeah. so bad. And, I mean, when you're in high school, girl, yeah. you're already insecure. Yeah. And I remember, like, I would just cry, like, off the court. And I and it, it really affected how I played. I mean, before all of that, I would, you know, easily score 25 points a game. After that, I was, like, barely getting 10. I just couldn't. Wow. It was, like, yeah. so really in my head. You. Really affected me. And I never really recovered from that as far as sports went. I mean, I always struggled because I was just, like, new people were looking at me yeah, or saying things hard. or whatnot. So high school was really hard. And I remember like crying because to my mom, because everybody would, would say like, you know, you meet your best friends in college or high school. Like, those are your lifelong friends in college. And I n- knew at this point I wasn't going to go to college. And I was like, I'm never going to have friends, yeah. you know? And mm. like, how are people like, just felt so misunderstood. Yeah. And um, cause friendships are something I value so much. And that was like so stripped. And I, I remember just telling God, I would rather you take all of this away so I can just be normal and have friends. If it means that like, it's going to be this isolating. And I look back at that and it's so sad, but that is so not my life now. Yeah. And I, I think, you know, a lot of that makes you who you are, but it was definitely really hard at the time. Yeah. I had the yeah. same thing with like sports and stuff Yeah, when I was in school. So I only did the first two years of high school, but I had the same thing where like when I would play in a football game or something and everybody would have like shark boy signs or whatever. Um, and then when I stopped going to school, I still wanted to like support my friends that were playing and I couldn't go to a game without the entire other side, like chanting team Edward or like literally it was just a distraction to the whole game. And I eventually just stopped going to games. Yeah. Cause then you feel like responsible for taking away from the experience from your friends. And I felt the same way. It's like, I don't want to even like fun things like, Hey, we're going to this concert. It's like, well, I don't want to go because I know if I go, then people are just going to take pictures of me the whole time and it's going to be annoying to everyone there. Yeah. So then you choose not to go. But then it's like so isolating, you know? Yeah. yeah. So that's so hard. I totally yeah. relate to that and had the same high school experience. High school. Yay. I know. It's <laughs> tough, man. People that are like, these are the best years of your life. I'm like, nope. Hey, for everyone listening, if you're in high school, just yeah. hold out. If yeah. you think that's going to be the best and it's not good for you, there is more to come. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A lot more to come. I also found that for me, the people in high school that were like the coolest people that you like were like, oh, I'd love to be them one day. This uh, this isn't true for everyone. Mm -hmm. But I look back at now and like they're they're doing nothing. And Mm -hmm. like it's just like because the way that most people become popular in high school are not the right ways and not the ways that oh, you become totally. like, yeah. successful and loved in it's life. not sustainable, like the actions and everything. And I also found some of the meanest people to me, uh, some of them have come around and, you know, uh, apologize and we've gotten to actually be friends. But some of them, it's like, I don't even know what they're doing. You know, it doesn't even yeah. matter. You know, it's yeah. like totally, it's a, I, I agree. Yeah. Like some of the meanest and coolest people you look at now, you're like, yeah. that is so crazy. No. Yeah. Wow. It is it is kind of cool that like you guys became famous, so to say, in high school and like you were able like that's such a defining time. Totally. You're like able to like weed out and like learn people's intentions early on. Totally. That young is really cool. Totally. I want to talk about fear. You touched on it a little. How has fear affected you? Is that like the biggest yeah. thing that's has affected your mental health? Have you always yeah. had fear? That's definitely the thing that has affected my mental life the most, for sure. Um, but I will say just before I even start saying this, because I know so many people walk with like crippling anxiety and I was there and I'll give you a little bit of a window into what that looks like. 
But I remember thinking, I will never outgrow this. Like, this mm-hmm. is a part of who I am. Yeah. I am an anxious person. I'm a fearful person. It's part of my personality. And I think, like, the longer that I said those things over myself, I just excused, um, I just really excused that way of living and just kind of became comfortable in it. Yeah. And what's amazing is that I sit here today, years later, and I am not a fearful person. And I'm not like, that is not my story. That does not mark my life. Um, I do not have anxiety like I used to have it. Do I get afraid? Yes. And I think that's part of being human. Yeah. If you if you don't get afraid, it's actually dangerous. You should yeah. have a little yeah. bit of fear in your life, but it does not define me. It does not call the shots for me. It does not drive my life. And so just just as an encouragement to people listening, um, fear is not just like a part of your personality and it's not a, it's not who you are. It might yeah. be affecting you and it might be shaping a little bit of who you are, but it doesn't have to define you and you really can get out of it. Because um, I just remember thinking that just would never happen for me. Because I was so afraid. And I, for as long as I could remember, I was afraid. I mean, when I was little, it would be like, no one's afraid at school when it rains. And I'd be like, there's got to be a tornado. Like, <laughs> just like worst case scenario kind of person. Yeah. Um, but then when I grew up, it became like a lot bigger than that. It was just like, I was so anxious all the time. Um, I would I have a fearless tattoo on my wrist because I would just constantly just be like grabbing my wrist. My hands would be shaky. I would, I would think that I was going to like... Um, I don't know. I would think that I couldn't breathe, even though I very well was capable of breathing. I would think that like I was going to pass out. even though I was totally fine. Like I just yeah. always thought something bad was going to happen or fear for maybe there was reason to be afraid or maybe there was no reason at all to be afraid. Yeah. I would be like physically feeling fear. Um, and I think that started mostly whenever the show started happening and more so when I was on Dancing with the Stars um, because you know, I had a lot of weird people following and that just got in my head and made me like overthink everything. And then um, I was actually in a pretty unhealthy relationship. And honestly, I think a lot of the anxiety that I had stemmed from living a really hypocritical lifestyle. It was like my life on social media looked really perfect and my private life was not at all yeah Yeah. and I think trying to live this um kind of lie Mm -hmm. led me to being just extremely anxious and like I think just my soul within me was at was just not at rest because I was not living true I was not living organically and so that manifested its way in a lot of different ways and a lot of that was just anxiety attacks I mean it was just crazy and I remember I would call my mom when I was having an anxiety attack and she would always quote the scripture over me. Do not fear for I am with you. Be not dismayed for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will uphold you on my righteous right hand is in Isaiah. And I just remember like not loving that because yeah. I just remember like, you know, when people are like, hey, here's a Bible verse. You're like, don't be afraid. And it's like, yeah, like. Good that, wouldn't that be but awesome like, if I could just... Yeah. I just can't stop being afraid. Like, I just didn't get how that was supposed to really affect or change my life. Yeah. And so one day, I started really studying it. And what I found was, like, so powerful. You know, there there is a lot of places in the Bible that say, do not fear. And when you're afraid, especially if you walk in faith or in the Christian life, people will tell you all the time, do you know how many times the Bible says do not be afraid? And you're like, yes, I get it, but I'm still scared. <laughs> but I just remember, like, I really started looking into it. And it was, like, almost every time after... God said, do not be afraid. It said, for I will be with you. And something shifted in me where I was like, oh gosh, like it's not just like he's commanding us to not be afraid. He's not just saying like, don't be afraid. You should not be scared. Like, you know, people make it sound. He's actually giving you this promise of himself saying, you don't actually have to be afraid because I will be with you. And when you think about that, God will be with me. And if God means something to you, if God is God, yeah. if God is the creator of the universe and a strength and a shield and a protector and the great I am, then that's a big old promise, you know? And I just remember starting to be like, okay, I'm not going to focus so much on like the do not be afraid and trying to just drill in my mind to like stop being afraid. I'm going to yeah. focus more on that like, okay, if God is with me, I don't have to be. And so started kind of shifting a lot of the way I was thinking and helped me a lot. But it wasn't really until honestly, I started living an honest life. I started weeding out that relationship that I was in. I started being more authentic on social media. I did a YouTube video. It's my first YouTube video ever where so stripped down, didn't have makeup on, wet hair, got out of the shower, really just kind of was like brutally honest about my life and what it looked like and my insecurities. 
and I wasn't planning on posting it. I didn't even have a channel. My little sister created me a channel to post it. She's like, you have to post this. Wow. And that video went viral and uh, it kind of like exposed like me for being me. Yeah. And although that seems scary, that is actually like the biggest breath of fresh air that yeah. could have happened to me. And um, fear started to just like slowly wash off. But I have to say like, Again, not even that simple. I had to go to counseling. I um, went to Dr. Amen. I don't know if y'all... Yeah. We just got a brain okay. scan. Oh, wow. Okay, yeah. so that like changed a lot for me. He oh, just gave wow. me like a lot of practical tips and really walked through what my brain had experienced and some of the trauma that it had experienced from fame and what that looks like. And um, it really was after that and making some practical life changes, like again, living more honestly, stop yeah. drinking caffeine, like just simple things like that. Yeah. And um, over the past, I guess since I've seen him, that was probably two years ago. Okay. I've only had one anxiety attack and it was in the middle of the night and it was just a, like a dream. Like it wasn't even like real. Holy and crap. Um, I used to have them all the time. And in two years, I've had one. And so uh, that's why I say it at the beginning of this is like, you actually can live like a life that is um, without being defined by fear, yeah. even if you're in the midst of it right now. Because, um, I mean, gosh, I, there's nothing I could do to to help you understand how how severe it was at the time and how much fear and how it shaped everything about me. But now it's like doesn't it's not doesn't touch me. It's crazy. Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm a very <clears throat> fearful person too. Um, always have been. Yeah. And I've, I definitely have not conquered it yet. Um, still working on that. But something I did learn that like, at least just helped me l live with it was for me, a lot of, a lot of like great things in my life did like come from fear. Mm -hmm. Or like, yeah. I, I found that like when you're scared of something, it's, usually like a good thing like you told the story about dancing with the stars and you were like no i'm not doing it when i was 17 um i was asked to host snl and right away i literally got a phone call from lorne michaels asking me if i will host snl and i said no <laughs> because i was terrified yeah i was like i don't sing i don't dance i don't do accents i don't know what i would do on saturday night live <laughs> Um, so I literally was like, thank you so much, Lauren, but, um, I can't do this. <laughs> and then I hung up and I think he like texted me or something. He's like, just think about it. And I thought about it. I slept on it. And even though I was still terrified, I was like, okay, this is like a once in a lifetime opportunity. Yeah. Like maybe some good will come from this. I don't mm -hmm. know. And I just like closed my eyes and I was like, screw it. Let's do this. And it ended up being the coolest yes. experience of my life. And like, it's true. and I feel like it broke down so many walls that I had just like, you know, telling myself, I can't do this. Mm -hmm. I can't do that. And that, you know, was when I was 17. Yeah. And since then, things like that have happened over and over. Yes. Where, um, like a ridiculous six yeah. I'm friends with Adam Sandler. He called me. He was like, I got this crazy movie. You know, your character is wild. Mm -hmm. It's like no pressure to do it. But, you know, read the script, read the script. I was like, definitely not. There's no way I can do that. Yeah. And it's one of my favorite projects I ever did. Yeah. But I was terrified. of Yeah. It. I think fear. I think it really can be a good thing. I think if you lean into it, when I say fear doesn't touch me, I don't mean I am not affected by fear. Yeah. I don't feel fear. I just mean it does not call the shots for me. Yes. Yeah. It is not own me. It's not making me sit in the corner or yes. uh, run off the airplane crying because I think it's going to crash. I'm yeah. like, no, we're going, yeah. <laughs> you know, like we're yeah. getting there. Um, you know, it's not telling me what I can and yeah. cannot do. And I think that a lot of people, it's like they wait for, like this, oh, it's like, because I feel fear, then maybe I shouldn't do it. But I'm like, no, like sometimes like the peace is waiting on the other side of your trust, on the other side of your yes. And like when you do it afraid, um, man, that's what builds your confidence to do other things afraid. And I went through this like crazy time of my life where I was like, I'm just going to like own fear and I'm just going to like do scary things. And I was like doing like practical scary things like, OK, I want to go skydiving because this is just like scary and I just want to like own it. And yeah. so I just did it. And I was just like, man, like it's great. It's growing my confidence that I can do things when I'm afraid. Yeah. And still, like I speak a lot of places. That's what I do 
And people ask me, are you still scared? And I say, yes. And I say, but I love it. Like, I, I, I'm, I'm glad that I feel nervous because if I didn't feel nervous, then it would mean I didn't care. Yeah, you know, exactly. like yeah. those nerves and that fear is like, okay, I really care, and I, but I'm still going to say yes. And so it kind of goes back to what my mom said. You're going to have a lot of excuses not to do something. And some of them might be legitimate and real. And yes, listen to that. But if fear is the only reason, then you're doing it <laughs> because yeah. fear should never drive the ship of your life. And so um, I totally advice. agree. Fear is at times a good thing to lean into. There is a toxic fear of like I'm drowning in my anxiety or there is a healthy fear of like I feel it, but it's not going to stop me. Yeah. That's you just need to be the boss of your fear. Yes. Not the other way around. Yes. Own that fear. How um, how cool of your mom to like give you that advice too like oh, that's she's just, the best like, like that's yeah. so special of like her being like oh, if you can give me a real answer yeah. mm-hmm. then you don't have to go but mm-hmm. if it's yeah. just fear then you're doing like that's just oh and I thought I hard love- I was like all night I remember just thinking like what is my like <laughs> my good excuse and just nothing it was like no- well uh, it all went back to fear you know yeah. <laughs> every other thing was like the root was fear and man I'm so glad and I was terrified all 11 weeks of Dance with the Stars every time I heard the click click oh <laughs> and then the gosh. music turned on I was like how am I doing this you know <laughs> um but gosh I look back at that and I'm so thankful that I did it because again it grows yeah. your confidence every time you do something afraid it's um, yeah. actually a really powerful thing to challenge yourself to yeah, yeah and such like once in a lifetime things like that for you yeah. SNL like it's it's yeah. so true and how cool like honey and future baby get to oh, look yes. back at that like our kids will look back at all the stuff you've done one day yeah. I just think that's like so it's special so cool. and a good life lesson to show them and be like I was terrified to do this yes. like you can go and conquer whatever because yes. I, I couldn't do that yes it really is so cool and it's so inspiring because I mean it's not relatable when people are like oh I wasn't scared at all I just did yeah. it and you're like good for you man yeah. you know <laughs> but like it's something really powerful to hear of somebody say I was actually terrified but like I still did it. And I think that sometimes this generation, it's like we can be so quick to be like crippled by our labels that we place on ourselves. Mm-hmm. It's like, oh, well, because I'm anxious, then I don't have to do these things. I'm just going to excuse myself from that. It's yeah. like, no, like you're stronger than that. Like, yeah. yes, the anxiety is real. Yes, it's bad, but you are stronger than that. Yeah. And the more you say yes to doing it, man, the less it's going to have a grip on your life. Yeah. yeah. We had a guest on um, Lindsay Vaughn, and she had this really cool outlook of like mental health and like depression and anxiety that she dealt with that I had never heard of. And it was like her and her therapist looked at that just as like an injury. Like, oh, I Mm. I tore my tricep. Like I need to take like, it's going to heal, but I just need to take the steps to do that. And I had never looked at mental health that way before. Yeah, Like it was always just like this, like for her, it was hard because people were like, do you just take medicine and then you're happy? Like Mm -hmm. in the athletic world, mental health is very like, so and she of, like kind of broke down the walls yeah. like she she like came out talking about the things she struggled with probably 15 20 mm. years ago yeah and she struggled a lot with injuries throughout her career um that set her back and took like major major things away from her so to hear her compare you know her mental health and depression and anxiety yeah. and all this stuff to injuries the same way she overcame her torn ACLs she overcame that, but mm-hmm. you can't just like, you know, just wish upon a star. That- I remember when Dr. Amen said, you know, you need to stop drinking caffeine. And I was like, nope, like non-negotiable. Like, <laughs> I the love coffee. I'm in right now. Like, I'm- I, it's not, it's not happening for me, Dr. Amen. But, you know, then I was like, you know, it comes down to what do you desire most? You yeah. know, like, do you really desire coffee? more than you desire, like living a life of less anxiety. You know, I mean, it comes down to that, that thing in a, a, a lot of things in our life. It's like, what do I really desire most? And yeah. um, I just remember thinking, you know, this is really silly you know, yeah. that I'm like so addicted to coffee that like I can't stop. Yeah. Just it, if, if it's really going to help me. And so it was so cool. So I started small, like I went from coffee to tea yeah. and then I was like, okay. And then, um, I eventually stopped, you know, drinking tea because I saw the effect that it was like having on me. And now, you know, I'll have tea here and there and it doesn't affect me like it used to. Um, but what's really cool is that the reason why, so why not, why do you not drink caffeine? It's not just like, Oh, because you don't drink caffeine. He said, the reason why you shouldn't dr- drink caffeine, Sadie, is because your body, when it reacts to caffeine, what does it do? I said, well, you know, my heart races sometimes yeah. and I get shaky because yeah. caffeine makes you shaky. It makes my, my heart race. Personally, that's what it did for me. Yeah. 
And that is the exact same physical representation that anxiety has in my life. Mm-hmm. My heart starts raising. I start yeah. shaking. I start, and, and so what was happening is, is I wasn't actually anxious about something, but because I was having a physical reaction that mimicked anxiety, it was telling my brain, you're scared. Yeah. And so that's why I was constantly scared of things that I couldn't. The, if someone's like, what are you scared of? I'm like, I don't know. I'm yeah. just terrified. Like, I just think something's going to happen. Yeah. But when I eliminated that and I stopped physically feeling that fear, like I'm sitting here and I'm just like very chill and restful. Um, I don't feel afraid. You know, there's there's nothing in my mind telling me a lie. And your mind will lie to you. Like yeah. that's why you cannot let your feelings own you because it will lie to you. And um, so it helped me a lot. And then I was like, man, I'm so glad, you know, that, that I chose this. Yeah. And now after two years, I can drink tea and it's not a problem. And it doesn't make me feel that way. I know mm. how to kind of balance it. But I think sometimes you just have to go through like a hard like cold turkey moment of stuff. You know, yeah. it's like I gotta do the hard thing, put in the hard work, do the like it's like after you have surgery and they're like, you know, you're gonna have to do physical therapy and you're like, oh, it's gonna be hard, but yeah. you know it's gonna make you better. It's the same thing with your mental health. So that's a great comparison that she made. Yeah. yeah. I love like a visual comparison. So yeah, that was that, yeah. that stuck with me. Yeah. Um we've gotten a lot of like email requests of people wanting to have moms on, wanting to hear advice from moms. What's so awesome. people's adventure has been into motherhood um how has that been from you is there like something you learned about yourself or about just being a mom that you didn't you didn't maybe know going into being a mom that's good oh gosh I love being a mom (laughs) it is like the greatest it's been the greatest gift and the greatest treasure so we have an almost two-year-old named honey and she is like just as sweet as her name it's like the perfect name for her when we you know decide to name her honey um, it's a little bit of a different name and I'm but then when people like yeah. meet her they're like she is honey like that is so, so her sweet. yeah and she just rocks it so she's amazing and I remember just becoming a mom even just you know during pregnancy it already begins to make you a new person like it yeah. begins to shape who you are um, I think it it grows your capacity and your strength and your confidence. It made me a lot less like shallow and like thinking about myself so much less because it's such a selfless thing. You're constant, like everything, all your attention goes to your child. And I remember it shaped like a lot of like body image things for me um, because your body like takes on a whole new meaning. Like no longer is like my stomach uh, trying to look the flattest or the most fit. Now it's like, oh, wow. Like as it grows, I'm creating like life inside of me. Like all of a sudden, every part of your body is used uh, for the purpose of like another life. And so it just takes the focus off of you and puts it onto something so much greater. And that shifts so much of who you are. But I do remember um, speaking of mental health, that was probably one of the hardest times of my mental health was right after having honey. Mm. Okay. And, you know, people say they go through like depression or anxiety, like right after having their baby. And I did have bad anxiety after having honey. And it was, um, I think just a lot of the hormone changes and the craziness. For sure. I tried to keep working like right after I didn't like give myself time. And you've got to give yourself time. And yeah, like, I, bet. I think one thing that it's taught me, though, is, again, what do you desire the most? Like, what's the most important thing to you? And it helped me, like, stop and like prioritize my life better. Um, instead of trying to, like, manage everything, I'm like, okay, what really matters? My family, like my husband, my daughter, our family. That is my first ministry. That is my first job. That is my first love. And so really pouring time into that and then setting my work balance straighter and literally going through a lot of changes within Live Original, which is my ministry of like, okay, we need to hire more people. We need more people. We need people here and there. And doing all those things set me up to actually be at a place now where I get to just enjoy like our family and be the best mom I can be and do a good job at my job. And I do feel like, you know, some people think, you know, when they have a kid, they have so much mom guilt to like work and stuff like that. But I really do feel like God's called me to do what I do. And I think that if God's called you to something, like he will equip you for it. And I think he's given me the capacity to be a great mom and a great boss. And I think you can do both. And Dr. Amen actually told me, because I started talking to him about mom guilt and just going back to work and how hard it is. And he said, Sadie, if you raise your kids out of guilt, you will raise confused children who are entitled. And I was like, whoa. Yeah. And he was like, because if you go home and you feel guilty for working and you just give them whatever they want and yeah. you just act out of guilt, they will be confused and they will be entitled. He was like, you need to be a confident parent. And um, learning how to be a confident parent 
was probably like one of the best pieces of advice for me. And when I look back, I think your confidence starts even whenever you're pregnant, because I mean, really the whole, the whole journey is leading you to really be confident in your decisions because there's so many different ways you can go about things. Are you going to have a C-section? Are you going to have a vaginal birth? Are you going to use formula? Are you going to breastfeed? Are you going to, you know, stay at home? Are you going to work? It's like all these things. And people will judge the heck out of you. People will have an opinion. Everyone will tell you what you should, what you shouldn't do. And it really starts from the beginning of, I have to be confident in the decisions I'm making and the way that a parent and the way I love this child because no one loves this child more than I do. And I'm going to be confident in that. And so I think just for moms listening, like really focus on being a confident parent because being a confident parent is going to raise confident children. And that's been a great gift um, to learn and to walk through. And I had to walk through that the hard way in some some areas, but gotten a lot better. That's so encouraging because that's, I mean, obviously I'm not a mom, but even just now, like being married that like, I, I work way too much. Like I, my brain does not turn off. Mm-hmm. And that's been something like I've had to learn to set boundaries because yes. like, like uh, I, this is my first priority right here. And then the work needs to be second. Yeah. Um, and so I've, I want to get that down packed. I think that's probably why I want to wait to have kids is because I like, I want to make sure that I can set that boundary. Cause yeah. I know once that baby comes, I'm not, I'm not going to want to like yep. do anything and I'm not going to be like, there needs to be a boundary set for me because I, I love yeah. what I do. I still want to work. I still need to make sure I have time for my husband. Mm-hmm. So like, that's like something that I, I know that I struggle with. So I'm trying to work on a little bit now, but that's yeah. so encouraging that like you're like able to do that as a mom. Hey, it's a hard thing to learn. Yeah. I mean, I remember one of my best friends was, um, you know, she had like a natural birth and she like loved it mm. and was very big on like me having a natural birth, like encouraging me in that. Yeah. And I wanted to have a natural birth. I really did. I was like, that would be awesome. Like it sounded beautiful. And yeah. the whole thing was like so spiritual and so amazing. I was like, I love that. Well, it got time for me to have honey and honey wasn't coming. I mean, mm-hmm. we're 41 weeks. She's wow. not like nothing's happening, like nothing. And my husband says, Sadie, like, I really think you need to get induced. I, I mean, I think this is like the doctor was telling me for three weeks I need to get induced he's telling me and I'm just like I want to have a natural birth because you know I wanted I I told people I was going to do that and I didn't want people to think I was weak or I was like afraid of the pain so I was just like no like I have to do this and then God really softened my heart and I went in at my 41 week appointment and my doctor's like you're not like moving at all like nothing's happening here and I really think you need to get induced and I was just like okay you know if you feel that way then, then let's do it well, I ended up getting induced and thank the Lord I did. And I got an epidural because we had a really bad birth situation happen. She got stuck. Gosh. It was very scary. It was, it could have been way more traumatic than, than it was. It was traumatic, but thankfully she was okay. And I was okay is the most important thing. Yeah. But if I wouldn't have had the epidural, if I wouldn't have gotten induced and I would have tried to do a natural birth, there is literally no telling. It would have been very, very dangerous for her or me or both of us. We could have both ended up in a really bad place, if not, not alive. I'm not even kidding. That's how bad it was. And so I say that to say, you know, I think what I realized then is like, I cannot let what other people think of me and dictate how I parent. Yeah. Like I have to trust what God's telling me, what God's speaking to my husband, what we decide as a family is best for our life. And I really, I think I'm so, I mean, I hate that that happened, but I'm glad that I learned it, yeah. that lesson, because then I realized the gravity of what it holds to be confident in your decisions as a parent and as a husband and wife, as a family. And so that's really helped me just become more confident because I realized the effects of what could happen when you make decisions for wrong reasons. Yeah. Now, I mean, that's not to walk in fear and be like, what if I make a mistake? You're yeah. going to make mistakes. You're going to, oh my gosh, I make parenting mistakes every day. There are some <laughs> times where I'm like, honey, sorry about that one. I'm learning. <laughs> I'm learning too, you know? You're learning. I'm learning. We've tried to potty train. Didn't work. We're going to start again another time. You know, you're going to make mistakes. So please hear me when I say you don't have to be perfect. Yeah. That don't put too much on your hands that you think every decision is f- fatal or, you know, yeah. one that's life or death. That's not true. Yeah. But it is true that when you are confident in your decisions, it really does shape your family and uh, it just brings you all to uh, a much better place than walking in insecurity or what other people think of you. Yeah. I feel like the, there's a lot of like chatter. Well, especially just because a lot of our friends have had babies mm-hmm. recently. And I feel like there's like so much input from the world and this like, people are like, oh, this worked for me. Oh, this worked for me. And like trying to decide like what I remember Taylor asked me 
one day he was like, are you going to breastfeed? And I was like, obviously he's like, oh, I didn't know if you would. And I got offended by that. And I was like, why am I offended right now? Like, it's like, there's just like such, there's, it's so just touch and go. And at at the end of the day, you just need to realize like, it's whatever. Like yeah. and now there's a lot of our friends that didn't breastfeed and yeah. that just did formula. I'm like, oh, yeah. I'm 100% doing that now. Like, yeah. I've seen, you know. I like, also just don't know anything. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. yeah. He, was that. he was asking no that. He was asking that with the purest intention. He just like, did it. he doesn't know anything about anything. So yeah. he was Well, like, that's good to bring up though because that is one of the biggest things to breastfeeding or formula. And I remember like, everybody was like, you have to stick through the pain. Like, you have to work through it. And I was in the hospital. We went through such a traumatic birth. Everything was not working well. We tried to breastfeed. I was like, no way yeah. like this is just not happening but I felt so guilty so I was like trying to do it and it was not happening for yeah. me like literally nothing was coming out wow. and finally this nurse sweet lady she comes in at like midnight and I'm trying to pump trying to breastfeed nothing's happening it's frustrating I'm in so much pain from what happened earlier and she goes she goes sweetie she goes I know you're seeing everywhere breast is best she said but a happy mama and a happy baby is what is best happy yeah. and healthy and she said your baby will be fine she said and then I was like yeah, I mean my mom fed me formula and I'm fine like, I know, yeah. like it's, it's I fine i was just so scared because everybody's like this is the best thing blah, blah, blah. and uh so we started doing formula in the hospital and it was the best thing for our family i'd yeah. actually ordered a very organic formula just in case anything happened a couple months before and we tried it honey immediately took to it loved it that's what we've done all the way up it's been the best thing for our family and yeah. Yeah. it was so awesome too because as i was healing christian was able to bottle feed you yeah. know in the night and it's like such a gift. And I was like, man, like this is awesome. And yeah. so you really do have to make the best decision for your family. And yeah. even saying that, I know people listen to this podcast are like, I can't believe you didn't breastfeed. But like, hey, give grace for like other people and like the story that they're living. Like yeah. you can only control you and you know yeah. what's best for you and your yeah. family. And I think it's so important that we just do what's best for us, yeah. and not what other people yeah. are saying or putting on you. Because every story is different. Yeah. Exactly. Some people, it works for them. Yeah. And for us, gosh, we travel so much. And I'm, constantly in front of people it's so nice that we can do formula and yeah. christian can take care of those moments whenever i need to be away and so yeah. yes it's been a gift to us yeah. that's so true we got a lot to look forward to <laughs> sounds fun he's like i didn't even understand half of what you just said I know. <laughs> okay last little point before we get into our lemon 11 um i'm just curious what is your story behind like the title live original like where did that come from that's like that is that is you when i think of you i think of live original i think of low like what what's the story behind that yeah this is such a good story i'm glad you asked so whenever i was young i thought it was like the coolest thing in the world to have a nickname i was like only cool people have nicknames i need a nickname (laughs) and my dad was like nickname king like everybody had a nickname if you came into my house like you were gonna have a nickname all my best friends had nicknames they're so cool my brother had like 12 like literally Literally, it was like, pick the day, like new nickname. My sister had nicknames, but he never had a nickname for me. It was always just Sadie. And I was just like, dad, like, <laughs> am I not cool? <laughs> give me something like, am I not cool? Is there nothing you think of when you see me or you think of me? And it like really bothered me. And my dad said to me, he said, Sadie, you're just the original. Like, you're just so original. You just, you're just you. And like, that's, oh, that's enough. And I would just be like, no, that is not cool. Uh, the original, what does that even mean? You know, at a young age, like, what does that even mean? And my dad just kept kind of speaking it over me. You know, you're the original. That's who you are. Like, um, you're just you. And, and that's a great thing. And so my dad, I remember he was traveling one day and he saw like this sign. So like the original and he got it for me. And so it's like constantly something that my dad spoke over me. And, um, you know, of course, when you're little, you don't appreciate that as much yeah. as when you're older and you realize, oh my gosh, like what a powerful thing that my dad yeah. would affirm in me that who I was created to be yeah. is actually enough. And yeah. I don't have to be known as anything other than me for that to be something of value. It's like the greatest message Dang. that your dad can speak over you. Yeah. And so I remember whenever I was 16 and I'd actually gotten asked to speak somewhere and it went horribly. I was not a speaker. I hated public speaking. Again, I was so shy. I was so nervous. Like my personality is so different now than it was then just because of fear. When yeah. I mean, when you get rid of fear, it changes a lot of things about who you are. Yeah. And so my brother and I went to speak just because we were the Doug Dynasty kids. 
And I was supposed to speak for 30 minutes. I was probably on stage for maybe 10. Mm-hmm. And no joke, the people asked for their money back. It was that Stop bad. It. So I had a very humble beginning when it came to speaking. <laughs> and I was I came back home. I told my mom, I said, I'm never doing it, that again. That was horrible. <laughs> that was clearly not my calling, which jokes on me because that's what I do now. Oh I was like, gosh. that was like literally the worst. She's like, Sadie, but like you're such a good example and like, you have so much wisdom. And like, it would just be so great if you could encourage young girls. I was like, yeah, but not like that because <laughs> That was horrible. <laughs> and my mom was like, well, I mean, you just need to like, we, we need to practice. I was like, no, no, that was just so bad. And I was like, well, oh I was like, but it would be really cool if I could write a book. I was like, because like maybe I could put all this like advice at 16 that I had yeah. in a book. Mom said, well, that's a great idea. And she said, well, what do you want to call it? And I was like kind of thinking and um, I started thinking about what my dad said. And we started talking about the original. And my mom said, well, you could call it Live Original and encourage girls and being confident in who they were created to be. Mm. It was so cool. That day, like within an hour, I had like 10 chapter titles, like the whole idea for the book. I was like, this is the book. Um, I guess I was 15 when that happened because I started writing the book my sophomore year of high school with a co-author. I didn't do it all by myself, but the co-author. She was awesome. And we wrote the book Live Original. Well, again, I was was famous from Duck Dynasty, but not super super known for just me yeah and um then the book came out in october which happened to be right when i was on days for the stars so it like exploded like the message Mm. just went out and from there live original became a ministry and the irony of me saying i'm never gonna speak i'm gonna write a book because of the book live original i started speaking about living original and it was just so cool because Gosh, I mean, I really had to take my own message to heart. I was really writing everything. I was writing to me right. yeah. more than I would think I was writing it to anyone else. I think that's the power behind the message. You know, it's, yeah. it, it is very original. It's very honest and vulnerable. And um, it was at that same time that the YouTube video it was like all of a sudden I was like, you know what? I'm going to own who I really was originally created to be. Yeah. I'm not going to try to be who other people say I need to be. I'm not going to try to be who other people want me to be. Um, because at that time, you know, everybody wants you to be yeah. who they want you to be. Or it's, I, I said it like this when I was younger. I was like, I feel like everybody else knows who I am but me. I feel like everybody's wow. like, oh, Sadie, Sadie, Sadie. But I don't know who that is. Yeah. And um, the message of Live Original helped me discover who God really created me to be and own that. And it changed my life. And so it's just an incredible blessing wow. that it continues to change girls' lives and yeah. people all over the world. Um, but it definitely started with me. And I'm grateful for that. That's wow. so awesome. I have two points. One, that is like such, I feel like I just relate to that so much because I, I don't, I wouldn't define myself as a confident person, but I've never, how do, how do you, how would you like, I've no, I don't really ever get jealous. I'm not really like easily oh. bothered. I've always just been myself and I've been fine with that and just confident in the fact that I'm, I am me. And mm-hmm. if you like me, you like me. If you don't, whatever. And I feel like that like resonates so much and like hearing that, like young girls, they get to hear that from you now, like how encouraging that is. Cause I felt that about myself in junior high, high school, college, but I didn't like know it to the fullest that I do now. Mm-hmm. So I just think that's so cool because like, you're you no one else is you yep. like you need to just be confident in that and obviously maybe there's things you don't like about yourself but like you were made like yes. uniquely to be you there's no one else yes. that is you so i just love um that message but the other thing it's i was gonna gift. say september 8th and 9th i am so beyond honored Woo! to be going to low conference but i have to tell you um i I've been like praying and wanting to do something like that. So it's just, it's hysteric. I was reading my Christine Kane devotional and then awesome. I prayed for success. And then later that day, Steph emailed me. We, wow. were, in, we were in Franklin. We, we were in, yeah. no way. Yeah. Um, but when, um, so a big, <laughs> cool. a big reason behind it, why I do what I do, obviously nursing had a very big toll on my mental health, but my best friend, from high school, Jared, who he suffered bipolar and took his life. Um, he's a very large reason why I do what I do. He, I have his photo on my desk. Oh, that's awesome. Um, yeah. He inspires me like to do what I do. And when we started talking about the conference and they were like, it's in Monroe, I had this moment and I'm like, God is so funny. Jared's last name is Monroe. No way. And like this, this is like something wow. that I have been feeling that like, 
I want to do and I think wow. God has a plan for it. And it's, it's just so funny that wow. like the first thing is yeah. literally in the Monroe. The first thing is in Monroe. And yeah. I do what I do because of Jared. So wow. I had to just share that with yeah. you. I forgot. Like to- she started all <laughs> that of this. Lemons, so the squeeze, <laughs> all of it really started because of Jared. And then, you know, there's been plenty of things since, but like wow. that was how this started. And she's been wanting to like do something, you know, like she's going to wow. do at low. Um, and it's just crazy that the first one you're ever going to do is in the place that is literally wow. his name. See, you cannot miss God in that. Like those <laughs> yeah. are the kind of things like there are so many things in my life that happen where it's so specific and it's crazy. People are like, oh, it's by chance. It's like, no, that's by intention. Like yeah. the fact that God's bringing you your first time to like really do something like that in the fullness of all that you're doing to get to teach other people and help other people and yeah. impact other people in Monroe of all places. <laughs> Are you getting you the go. picture? That is the coolest story ever. And the day that you were praying for that. Yeah, it was, it wow. was just, it was just really, it was, it was comical. Honestly, it's just it's awesome. <laughs> he put his little photo there. That's so <laughs> awesome. <laughs> well, when so we, good. when I interviewed you for my podcast, like right after I told Sam, I was like, she needs to be at mm-hmm. a little conference. Like she need. we had a mental health already that we were going to do like a workshop. And um, last year we did, it was like a mix of fitness and mental health, like all kind of together. And we were like, wow, people really need both of these things in fullness. And so, and when we, when I say fitness, it's more like, how do you view, um, fitness is not just such like a self-centered thing and not just like a, my body has to look good, but actually like as a healthy thing. But then also like mental health is, it can be in that, but it, and eating disorders and stuff like that but it's also so much bigger and it's such a bigger conversation so we split it and we have my counselor doing it and our counselor on our team doing it and as a talk to you I was like she is the perfect finish to this lineup and so um, you were like one of the last people we added wow. we had already planned so much of it wow. and it was such a gift so to hear your side of the story is awesome yeah. it was so I felt so affirmed encouraged just like you inviting me to do that and like obviously like I've I like you affirm me and I know what I'm doing. I know what I'm doing and I'm supposed to be doing. And I've mm-hmm. gotten a lot of like so many messages, emails of people just saying like, I feel heard this and that, but like coming from someone like you who has, who is like, knows what they're doing, has all this stuff, not all this stuff, but knows mm-hmm. what they're doing and is impacting so many people for you to be like, Hey, I want you to speak at my event. Like that was so encouraging for me to be like, okay, I, I really, I, okay, I guess I know what I'm doing. Yes. Somewhat. I'm doing yes. the right thing. Yeah. Well, people, all, the, our whole thing with LO is because when we started it, I remember, you know how I told you I was praying to God back in high school. Like, I don't want this. Like, this yeah. is not, no, yeah. no, no, no. And I remember telling God, you chose the wrong person. I don't want to be famous. I never asked for this. I did not desire this. There are probably so many girls who would die to be famous. Like, why did you put me in this position? Why am I losing my friends and things that matter to me? Sports, like all this stuff. Just like really raw and honest with God. Like this is, you, something messed up. Like yeah. there's a kink in the system. And I just remember that it was just the coolest thing because um, I went to this conference and I'd never seen a woman like preach before because I grew up in a really traditional background. And this woman walks out on the stage and she preaches. And I was like amazed. Wow. At one, at what she was saying was like really impacting me. But two, uh, how she was saying it, just the confidence she was walking in, the way it was impacting my life, the, the whole moment it was like supernatural. And I was like, I'm going to do that. And and again, two years before, they asked for their money back. So for me to be like, I'm going to do that, it was a big deal. So <laughs> it was funny. different than it was the first time. It wasn't like I was just going because I was a Duck Dynasty kid. It was going because I was like, no, God put something in me yeah. that has changed my life. That maybe if I spread this message to other people, it would change their life. Like this woman's changing my life. And I went and responded, like did the altar call. And I never felt like, I never heard God speak to me. I never felt like I had a vision or anything like that. And um, up until this point, and when I say God spoke to me, I didn't audibly hear, but it was like the kind of speaking that you can't miss. It's so undeniable. And I just felt like the Lord said, I'm not calling you to be famous, like period. He said, Mm. I am calling you to be a sister and a friend to those who don't have one. And I remember when I heard that, I was like so relieved and I was like, 
I can do that. Like, yeah. Yeah. which was also funny because I was like, but I don't have a lot of friends, but, <laughs> but I want that. I desire that. So yeah. like, what I'm going to do is I'm going to be a sister and a friend to those who don't have one. And that simple message was like, okay, now how do I do that? Well, that started with like a website and a blog and then it led to a podcast and then it led to events and it led to speaking and it led to a tour and now it's a conference and it's like all these different things. And I have a whole team that pours into this and we just constantly pour into girls every single day, just being a good sister and a friend to them. And what what's a good sister and a friend do? They affirm who you are. They encourage you. They speak truth over your life. They laugh with you. They cry with you. They dance with you. They see you in your vulnerable moments. And I think that's one of the greatest gifts that you have is you are such a sister and a friend to people. Like you're so relatable. You're so kind. You're, you're fun and funny, but you're real and relatable. And that's why I'm like, you need to be there because you know, we have these counselors there and they're amazing and they are going to be awesome, but you're going to be there as like a sister and a friend and like your heart behind what you do is so pure Mm. that, uh, man, in the same way that I'll watch someone change my life and then want to do that for others, you're doing that for so many people. And I can't wait to see the impact. It's going to be awesome. Mm. It's true. Come join us. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Come join us. DC is going to be there too, right? She's going to be there. Yes. We have a good crew. It's going to be so much fun. Yeah. I think that was part of the reason why I like went. I think when Steph sent the email, she's like, we have this person, this person, this person. I was like, uh, <laughs> yeah. Hey, speaking of your Kristen Kane devotional, she's speaking. Yeah. I, oh, trust me, I, I literally had my. It's on my desk, my that's devotional awesome. book. I had it with us in Nashville, and yeah. I, it's, that's crazy. <laughs> oh, it's gonna be. It's gonna be fun. <laughs> that's awesome. Okay, let's head into our lemon eleven. Let's questions. do it. Our woot, favorite woot. eleven. How do, do you want to do odd, even, even odd, odd? Um, sure. I'll start it off. Okay, great. Okay, hit us. Okay, here we go. Number one, this one's fun. Mm-hmm. What movie or song title best describes your mental health today? That was good. Okay, so I saw some of these questions before, I have to say. But the first thing I thought of was, people are shocked to know this, but one of my favorite genres to listen to is Christian rap. <laughs> and, yeah. and there's a song called Good Lord by Andy Mineo. Uh-huh. And it is like, that is totally like my mental health. Like, I love it. It makes me dance. It's so fun. But he's like, uh, basically saying like, even if everything goes wrong, I still got a good Lord. And I like love it. And I was like, that's kind of my mental health sometimes. I'm like, you know, even if I feel this way, I still got a good Lord. Like yeah. he's on my side. So today's not my best day, but, <laughs> but I got a good Lord. Oh my gosh. Wait, I he's like that. the the coming in hot guy. Yeah. Yes, right? yeah. yes. Andy Minio, he's the best. Oh, like wow. Andy Minio, uh like this oh, yeah. is Andy Minio on Spotify is like my thing. Oh my gosh. <laughs> you got that's a new so genre. Yeah, there we go. First in rap. <laughs> okay, number two. How open are you with the people in your life when you're struggling? I am um, actually super, super open. My mom always says, she's like, Sadie's greatest superpower is she tells everybody everything. Um, And I think that that is a superpower whenever you know who to tell what to, you know, so I don't tell everybody everything. I think that a lot of people probably think I do because I am vulnerable and I, I share hard things on platforms, but I do not share everything on big platforms. I think there's a difference between being transparent and vulnerable. And I'm definitely really vulnerable to my friends and my family. And then I'm more transparent to the world, letting yeah. them know a little bit, but not everything. Yeah. But I think that that is such a great uh, strength is to be able to open up to the people around you because, uh, man, the scariest place to be is alone and in hiding. Yeah. And so, um, I mean, I encourage everybody, if you have one friend to tell yeah. what you're going through. Uh, uh, Matt Chandler preached this message one time and he said, you can let people know 99% of your life, but if you still have the one, then that one will eat you up. Yeah. And he's like, tell somebody the 1%. Yeah. And uh, doing that has really helped me just with my husband and yeah. my mom, like my, my close, close people yeah. Yeah. has been a gift. I yeah. love that. Yeah. Okay. Number three, what is your favorite part of your morning or night routine? Okay, so this question is funny because I, like I said, I'm not not a routine routine. person. And I have to say, uh, one thing that I think has been a game changer for me is to stop putting the pressure on myself to have a routine. Because then I'm like constantly disappointing myself that I don't keep my routine. But with Honey, it's made me a little bit more routine because, you know, she thrives on routine. (laughs) Um, Yes, she thrives more on routine. She's not super structured. She's like me. She she can go to bed kind of whenever. But we, always read a book and watch Little Bear at night like Little Bear is our thing so every night we watch Little Bear and if we don't she's like 
she says couch like couch like we're watching <laughs> Little Bear and it's like the best and so I like really look forward to every night oh watching gosh. Little Bear with Honey and like <laughs> that's just the sweetest Christian said the other night we'll all three watch Little Bear together he's like this is like the, my favorite time of my whole life and I was like me too like it's oh really gosh. I was like the best days of our entire life yeah. just watching Little Bear with Honey and all the just joys of being parents right now it's just been yeah. sweet hard but sweet yeah. yeah it's such a special time I could only imagine for both of you like how much you want to soak up those moments oh, because gosh. they just grow so fast. So and like fast. Years from now, you're going to wish you were on that couch watching Little Bear. Trust me. I know. I cry. Like if I'm like, we're not going to watch Little Bear, but thankfully we have another kid coming. So Little Bear will continue. <laughs> yeah. They're going to be like 10. We're going to be like, you want to watch Little Bear? <laughs> <laughs> like, Mom, no. Okay, new movie. But we got to watch something. Like it's so fun. <laughs> oh so my cool. gosh. That's so tender. <laughs> I love that. Uh, how has your career impacted your well-being? That's good. Um, gosh, I think if my career has packed my well being a lot after I started doing what I really felt called to do in a positive way. I think for a long time, I was just saying yes to everything because it was like exciting. But when I got really specific on this is what I'm doing and this is why I'm doing it and I started doing that fully, gosh, it made me uh, such a, honestly, a better person um, because like I said, everything I'm doing right now is challenging me. Um, the books that I write, the first person I'm writing it to is, is me. The messages that I that I preached, first person that needed to experience that was me. Um, the the app that I created is because I needed something like that. You know what I'm saying? It's like it's impacting me because it's stuff that I feel like I needed to change my life, and it's helping other people change theirs. So it's impacted me in a huge way, and I think it's kind of been my own accountability in a lot of ways. That's awesome. Yeah, I can relate to that a lot. Just mm-hmm. like you know, when you first get all these awesome opportunities. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, when you're working just to work, mm-hmm. it's not fulfilling. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I definitely went through that stage where I was doing yeah. all these awesome things. And you would think that brought like happiness, mm-hmm. um, but it doesn't. Um, and only recently in my career, like when, you know, and I'm blessed to be able to do this, yeah. but to be able to pick and choose, you know, to do things that I want to be doing, yes. that I'm passionate about, mm-hmm. working with people that I want to work with. Yeah. Um, that's, you know, that was the change for me. Yeah. That definitely changes everything when you start doing the things that really represent your heart, yeah. you know, what you want to do, yeah. for sure. All right. Number five, what is the most misunderstood thing about you? Gosh, th- this one was hard. When I read this, it's like, what is the most misunderstood thing about it? I think like whenever you are known to a lot of people, you kind of have to get okay with the fact that you're going to be misunderstood. Yep. Yeah. And I think the more soon in your life that you can be okay with the fact that people will misunderstand you and not let that change you or not let that uh, work you up or worry you is... Um, I mean, the, the faster you can do that, the better. I remember yeah. some, a mentor told me, she said, Sadie, just let the fruit of your life do the talking. And that was so good for me because, you know, when people must understand you want to defend yourself, you want to ex- over explain yourself. And, um, you know, I just have to let the fruit of my life do the talking. And so I couldn't think of something like super specific, but I mean, I think it's just a lifetime of you know, being misunderstood. Yeah. Like I said, in high school, I felt so misunderstood. Yeah. Um, I felt like they felt like I was choosing this over them. And I'm like, literally all I want is for you to like be my friend. Like I need you more than this. But you know, that's just the start of being misunderstood. I'm constantly misunderstood now uh, for doing the things that I do and why I do yeah. them or whatnot. But I just always hold to like, let the fruit of my life do the talking. Yeah. And yeah. I'm doing what I know is like best and true to the truest of my ability in my heart. Yeah. And it represents yeah. me. And I don't regret that. I'm not living a double life anymore. I'm living an honest life. And if that's the case, then, you know, integrity goes to distance. Yeah. Yeah. Love that. So true. I'm going to flip this question on to you because you asked me, what is the greatest advice you've ever been given? Yes, my favorite question. (laughs) So I always ask everybody on my podcast this question because that's actually how my podcast started was me and my mom were at this event at like a sorority and this girl asked me what's the best piece of advice that I've ever been given. And I answered it and it was, I'll still say the same piece of advice, but my great grandma, she's still alive. She's 91, almost 92. She's a legend. She's just so beautiful, (laughs) so wise. 
so incredible. That's actually one of the reasons we name Honey Honey is because she has this Southern voice and she calls all of us honey. And oh it's just gosh. like the, her thing. Wow. But she said to me one time, I came home, I was so worked up about something. And I can tend to be a little dramatic, you know, I'm a dramatic storyteller. And I was just all, can you believe that this person, this person, blah, blah, blah. And she said, Sadie, because I said, well, what should I do? Like, how should I respond? You know, like, what's my, what's yeah. my move? What's my next move? She said, Sadie, you are not kind to people because other people are kind to you. She said, you are kind mm-hmm. because that's who you are. Because yeah. you are a kind person. And it was just like such a slap in the face and a hug, you know, at yeah. the same time. It was like, wow, like I'm not kind out of response of other people being kind to me. I'm going to be kind because that's who I am. Yeah. And it was just a really good thing because you can take that into everything in life. It's like, I'm not going to respond out of emotion. I'm not going to respond out of what you give me. Yeah. I'm going to respond out of who I am. Yeah. And I think going back to even the misunderstood thing and so many things that the world can put on you, when you stop responding to things because of what other people are giving you and you respond to people because that's who you truly are, man, it's the best way to live because it helps you live yeah. with that integrity, not up and down an emotional roller coaster, such integrity. And so anyways, I said this at the event I, I gave this advice my mom had a, a mic on that she couldn't move it was like attached to her head and she was just like so in the moment and she went whoa that's good <laughs> <laughs> and, and literally we go backstage I said mom that was so funny when you said that everyone started laughing and oh she's my like gosh it's just like I know it was so funny it was like mate that could be my podcast because we've been talking about what should my podcast be called what yeah. should the oh, theme wow. be and we decided to title it whoa that's good because of my mom doing that and oh then ask gosh. people the question what's the best oh, piece of advice you've ever been given that's awesome <laughs> and that's funny oh, that all ties it's like that's such so like an cool. organic like yeah. moment of my mom just being like whoa that's good <laughs> and I was like that's good that's <laughs> really good You're right, mom. That was good. <laughs> oh my gosh that's so mm-hmm. cool yeah that's I love hilarious that. <laughs> okay number seven um what does wellness mean to you wellness these questions I, I said this before we got on i was like this is the best like car ride conversations like yeah. um wellness gosh i think that my husband would be a really great one to answer this question and <laughs> i'll say what it's become to me because before christian i didn't have like the greatest view on like health and wellness um because i went through a time in my life where i just had really disordered thinking on eating and my body image and all that kind of stuff yeah and I think because I was so unhealthy then and didn't eat a lot and overworked out and over exercise and all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. I was like, well, now I'm just going to go the complete opposite way because yeah. I'm not going to live like that anymore. And I'm like, freedom and like freedom to me was just like, eat whatever you want, do whatever you want. And then that was really unhealthy. So then I was like, both ways were unhealthy. Yeah. I was like unhealthy because I wasn't eating and I was working out way too much because of this obsession with wanting to look a certain way or be a certain way and just kind of control something. Yeah. And then it was like totally unhealthy in the other way because I was like, well, now I'm just going to do whatever I want and eat whatever I want. And I felt like crap, you know? Yeah. And so when I met Christian, I was like scared of stepping into health and wellness because I'd never viewed it in a good way. So I had never had good balance with it. I never viewed it as something healthier, a way that it could really like actually impact me but he had such a healthy view of it and christian's just wellness overall i mean not just physically Mm -hmm. but spiritually and mentally and all of it um he just had such great discipline like he worked out not because it was like achieving just a goal but because like it made him feel good because he loved it because it was fun to him um gosh he he read his bible all the time because he loved to because that's just what he wanted not because he had to you Mm -hmm. know um his emotional he he's his mental health is like so impressive to me because like i just never met somebody who like wasn't anxious so you know we're like just so chill and i was like you really are not scared of me like you're just chill like he just not that he's not scared of anything but he just had like such good wellness but a lot of that was because of the discipline that he had set into place Mm -hmm. and so being married to him has been like really inspiring and it gave me a love for working out that I didn't have before because it wasn't about anything unhealthy. It was truly about just health. And what I found was I started working out in the mornings and it changed my perspective on things. It's where I thought the most. Like I asked my trainer if we could turn on worship music and I would leave um, working out and just have like the best thoughts. It's like where half my Instagram captions would come from, like my messages oh my would come from just because it was just like healthy for me. And then spiritual wellness just 
you know, um, doing like spending time with God because I desired to, not because I had to. That began to change me emotional wellness, all of it. And so uh, Christian helped me get on a good balance with that because I don't think it's healthy to obviously serve yourself. It's not healthy either to just indulge in yeah. all things because that doesn't even feel good. But when you yeah. have a fresh perspective and fresh eyes and accountability, whether it's your husband and best friend or somebody, yeah. that yeah. really helped me. Yeah. Wow. It's a good answer. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Props. Um, number eight. What is your relationship with social media, and do you think it affects your well-being? It's good. My relationship with social media is funny. I think that's probably a misunderstood thing about me. I think people probably think that I'm like super into social media mm-hmm. because I have a large platform. But um, over the years, I've gotten less and less. Uh, uh, I guess into social media. I wrote a whole book on social media called who are you following Mm. and it was really challenging to me to write that book because i think that you know with almost everything in life you can call the older generation and ask advice for and they can give you pretty solid advice because of things they walk through and i'm all about generations i'm all about asking mom asking grandma asking great grandma like what do you think about this but with social media, like we had no guide, no direction. It's just yeah. like, hey, young people, figure it out. And it's not going well, you know, for yeah, us. So funny. when you look at the statistics, you know, that has a huge effect on your mental health. And so yeah. I just remember being like, man, I want to give some direction into this. And I learned a lot from it. Um, and so what's cool, though, is like through that this past year, I feel like I was exposed to a couple of just unhealthy things that social media had on me. Now, here's the thing I have to say, right in this book, I always say this, I am not like anti-social media. I'm just like pro-healthy social media. And I think to have healthy social media, you have to be a healthy version of you. And I think that it really does start within. And so I love social media for all the good that it can bring, but I hate it for all the bad that it can also bring. And I think you have so much more control of it than you think you do. So anyways, so let's say, I'm in a place right now, currently with my social media, where I'm actually taking a break. My team is running my social media. And I said that at the beginning of the year, everybody knows like my team's running it. They're just posting more work things and stuff. And I'm uh, taking actually like the whole year off, which I hadn't like That's great. said that because uh-huh. I'm not like making a big deal about it. But I felt like I've had this in my life since eighth grade. It's yeah. been such a huge part of my life. Yeah. And I just want to see what happens when I strip it away. Yeah. And just in the first two, a month and a half, it's been really good for me. Wow. I think it's exposed a lot in me that I didn't even realize I thought about, didn't even realize, like took so much time in like my mental space. Yeah. And even the lies of like, well, if I take a whole year off, well, I'll be irrelevant. Or I take a whole year off, like how many followers I'm going to lose or I'm going to lose my yeah. algorithm, like all those things. And I'm like... I mean, how much weight does that really carry in my life, you know? Yeah. And so being willing to just lay that down and surrender that, gosh, it's been really good. It's been really good for our family. Just getting to like be totally present when I'm home. Yeah. That's what I really started feeling convicted of is last year I was like, oh my gosh, I'm sitting here. I'm, I was tired. I was home from work. I was exhausted. Laying on the couch. I'm like scrolling social media and honey's playing in front of me. And I'm not watching her. Mm. And I was like, I'm literally like watching everybody else's life but my own. And that really convicted me and started making me feel like, hmm, something's got to change. So I'm kind of in a, a, in a new fresh phase of social media right now. Sorry, my answers are so long. These are like such good car ride questions (laughs) and I'm I'm taking forever. (laughs) I've never thought about it like that with like the generation thing. Like there's so much to learn from each generation of humans. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I've never thought about it. Well, that, like, my mom and I have always like talked about it. She's like, why, why? I think it's also a generational thing. Cause I think like our parents' generation didn't really talk about mental health. Mm-hmm. It's very much like an, our generation thing, but she's like, why are so many of your friends like depressed or anxious yeah. or all this stuff? And I'm like, well, like social, I Let's fully believe what's new. <laughs> social media has such a, a large aspect, even if you're following like healthy stuff, sometimes like Mm -hmm. our brains aren't meant to consume the amount we're consuming. Like that's not, that's not Mm -hmm. healthy for us. And like, even if it's not healthy in the sense of like, I'm like, it's, it it could be unhealthy in the sense of you're following accounts that aren't bettering your mental health and are making you think less of yourself. But also, even if you're not, you're just scrolling aimlessly for hours. That's also, that was me. That's bad for you too. My accounts were great. You go onto my social media, you go to church, like everyone's so encouraging. It's so positive. It's not even that. It was just the mental space it was taking. Yeah. And like, I realized I'm never giving my brain a break. Like literally every like quiet moment I have, I'm scrolling, which is like not even quiet then at that moment, you know, because then it's like, you're getting all this input. 
And there are direct studies that show so much of how it's affected our mental health. Yeah. And I feel like it's just like the blind leading the blind. It's like, oh, well, it worked for her. And it's like, well, what is your idea of success? Is it having a blue check? Is it having followers? But at what expense? You yeah. know, mm-hmm. like what like what is working, you know? Yeah. And so, yeah, I think shedding light on what actually is good about social media and the balance you have to have is yeah. like so important um and i think it's a journey you know we're all on it's the yeah. first time a generation's gone through this yeah. so you have to learn as you go and i i like to think of things like in the long run yeah and i'm like okay a year right now might seem like a long time but in the long run it might totally reshape how i view this yeah. and i go about it in such a healthier way yeah and so i think you know looking at things not as like instant success like so many of us look at and fast things and just be like you know what yeah. we have time Let's just like give ourselves the time to actually do this well and right. Yeah. Very good. Okay. <laughs> Number nine. What is your favorite form of self-care? Oh, that's a good question. I think my favorite form of self-care is honestly just um, hanging out with my family and doing the things that like I love to do. Yeah. Like brainless activities. Like we love playing cards. We love, love um, playing tennis. Like things that just make me like. Yeah not really think about anything yeah. is like a gift and Love a that. great form of self-care and yeah just hanging with honey watching her be funny because she's just hilarious which i know that's not like self-care in the sense of like getting a massage but those are the kind of things that actually like fill me yeah yeah that's so true we have a friend that she gets fueled from like talking with people and yeah. taylor's like the complete opposite of that and he's like that <laughs> that doesn't fuel me but her is like when she's in social settings like that's what yes. she's also an eight on the enneagram and is that's just her personality so she's yes. very much fueled by that but yeah. it's just it's it's such a person by person oh, yeah for thing. me yeah. like having people over at our house is like my favorite thing yeah like, we have we have a group over every wednesday night and we watch sermons we hang out we make dinner we play cards and like those Love are that. just like the best yeah like, for me it just it definitely fuels me that sounds so fun favorite card games Favorite card games. Okay, right now we're really into nerds. Uh, Christian's probably over there like, that's not our favorite card game because he gets so frustrated because I'm weirdly good at nerds. I've like found like a new uh, hidden talent that I have uh, with nerds. But we also love Rummy. We play Rummy a lot. My sister and her husband are two of our best friends. And we went through like this Rummy kick. They come over like every night after we put Honey to bed. We just like play Rummy for hours. Um, and it's always really funny because something about cards makes you like the weirdest version of yourself. That's like, funny. and so we funny. always say like the weirdest conversations come out when we yeah. play cards and it's just like funny. Yeah. Everyone's just being like totally authentically themselves and it's the best. Number 10, who has had the most positive impact on your mental health? Um, I would have to say, well, my husband's sitting over there. He's really, like, really, if I don't say him, but no, he just mouthed your mom. It's true. My mom has, my mom has, my mom walked with me through all that anxiety, like a champ. I mean, there's a chapter in my book, Live Fearless called a uh, friend of fear. And it's talking about being a friend of someone walking through fear and anxiety. Cause it's really hard. You don't know what to do. You know, sometimes yeah. you don't know what to say. And, uh, when I look at the way that she handled it with so much patience and grace and never making me feel crazy for feeling fear, but also never letting me sit in it. Yeah. And it was just, she had the best balance of that. And it's yeah. been awesome. That's really but. special. Okay. Last but not least, number 11, Yeehaw. if you could go back to one moment in your life, what moment would that be? And what would you say to yourself? So this is a good question because I think you could go either way. You could go back to like the best moment of your life or you go back to some of the hard moments yeah. of your life. And I, I had like a flood of memories whenever I saw this question because I was thinking of some of the good moments that I would say, don't be so hard on yourself because I can tend to be really hard on myself and always think I could have done something better. But I thought about what... The, the most significant time of my life I would have gone back to and gave myself a little pep talk was whenever I was single and I would have told myself to chill out. I would have been like, stay single. Like I was constantly trying to get in relationships. I was constantly getting into relationships. Yeah. I went through just like having a boyfriend, breaking up next week, having another boyfriend, breaking up. Like, it was like constant because I so desired to get married at a young age and I wanted a family and I was like so desperate for that. Yeah. And I just wish I would have chilled and Relax. settled in the singleness because yeah. now I look at that time of my life I'm like man what a gift you know to to be single and to have time to get to know who you are and talking about that originality like to get to know who you are originally you got to have like no distraction you know you got to really be able to be okay with who you are and content with who you are and so I definitely would have gone back to that season of my life told myself to chill out told myself God has a plan and uh, you know people say you know you're going to find the one or whatever 
I just think that so many of us think that we really do have to find the person. Mm -hmm. And I really think if I was truly like looking, I don't think I ever would have found Christian. Like, I don't think it was in my hands at all. Like, I think it was so God. And we literally ran into each other one day so organically at the beach. Um, And it was like so perfect timing for him and me to meet because if we would have met any other time, it just wouldn't have been the right time. And um, we just were super... um, I don't know. It was just like, we just hit it off so well. And we became friends and it just happened so naturally. And um, I think I had this expectation what it was going to be. And it was just so much more natural and organic than that. And so I would have just told myself, just wait, you know, and, um, you know, people always ask me questions about singleness. And I always say, I wish I could give you good advice because I lived it. I'm going to give you good advice because I did the wrong thing. (laughs) and Just wait and be patient. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. I love that. I relate to that answer a lot. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Well, thanks for hanging with Thank us. You so I, much. Louise is that awesome. Was... I can't wait to watch this episode back. I'm already yeah. like so excited. No, to... myself just learned so much just from listening to you talk and I'm sure everybody else did too so thank you so much for being here y'all are awesome y'all are such good interviewers and y'all really do make it so fun and just like so homey and Squeeze is awesome y'all are doing such great things All right, everyone unfortunately this episode has come to an end but thank you for squeezing us in today we really appreciate it follow us Tay Lautner Tay Lautner The Squeeze make sure to follow at Lemons by Tay and check out lemonsbytay.com for additional resources and conversations we will leave Sadie's Instagram her live original her company everything below uh, for you guys to go check her out as well additionally you can email us at lautner.thesqueezepodcast at gmail.com if you guys have any questions we brought one up today in Sadie's episode Uh, if you have guests you want us to bring on whoever it may be Let us know. We love to hear feedback, advice, opinions, stories, recommendations. We love to hear it all. Uh, But most importantly, please continue to share your journey with us and with those around you and send our show to a friend that you think could use a little extra squeeze in their life. And last but not least. This podcast has been brought to you by Podcast Nation.